kao i dvi mislili. Hello, Miss Lily, how are you? Good morning. Good, how are you? Good, good. Uh, Mr. Nunez, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, so we have one more person um, and then we can start. Have a long day ahead of us. <laughs> Nine, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, 12. Ten. Let me check something in the bag. In one minute. Okay. Seven. Just one minute. So um, I think I think we can begin. Um, let me share the screen with you, and then. So um, oh, before we start, you, have you seen my announcement for this week for the assignment that I do next this week? Or when I say this week, the one that I do this week, I showed you last week. The one I put on assignment yesterday is for. That I do, that I do next week. So let me show you uh, some assignment for for this week. So not available yet. The announcement. I can show you the announcement from here. So this is for the four. Those are those ones that are due, you know, next Sunday. I see them here, read, read, reading material, chapter one, and chapter four and five. So uh, you're gonna read chapter five. We're gonna, co we'll cover chapter four to, to this morning. And you, you read chapter five before you can now be able to do the chapter four and five matching quizzes by Sunday, Sunday of next week. Then do chapter four and five practice quizzes by Sunday of next week. Then there's test one due on Sunday as well. And then we have this um, module assignment that is also due in March 14, which is uh, Sunday of next week. Uh, so basically all these things are the, uh, the one that I do next week, this Sunday. So uh, the one that I do this tomorrow, I, I showed you last week. So I can continue with that. Now, um, um. Professor, I think it's too much for one week uh, to read two chapters because I have three three classes more. So we're doing um we're not doing three chapters. It's two chapters. Yeah, two chapters for week is like more than hundred pages. So it's a little hard for me to to read all of that. Well, it's it's it's, it's not me. It's the is how the course is structured. Yeah, it's a twelve week class. So Usually, it's, usually the, for that, this kind of class, you might have some weeks you have to read two chapters. But in any case, remember we are covering chapter four, so you only have one chapter to continue to read. You see what I mean, Mister? No, I, I don't understand. But we'll be doing finish doing chapter four to just with, with me this morning. Then you have chapter to read chapter five. So you have all week next week to read it and then take the quiz. So now when we finish the four today, this morning, then you have tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to read the, the remaining chapter, which is chapter five, and then take the quiz. I don't I don't think it is too much for since we are doing one week, one chapter here already. And I'm gonna upload this uh the, the, the lecture here for you, both the lecture and the, the reading for, for the part four, four, and part five is there already for you, okay? You just 
uh, the way it's structured, if it's, it's a 16 weeks class, then you can talk up. Even even in 16 week class, sometimes they cover two chapters in a week. Um, any other question, Mr. Anders? Mr. Do you have any other question? Okay. Ms. Lin, how are you? Ms. Jenkins? I'm fine. Thank you very much for asking, sir. Good morning, class. Good morning. Good morning. Hmm. So I was just I just explaining to them what is due next this week. That is uh, next week. When I uh, when I say this week, I mean next week Sunday. Yeah. So you have any question before we begin? Yeah. Ms. Jenkins, do you have any question before we begin? No, Professor, I'm fine. All right. Uh, how about you, Miss 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 uh, Mash Mash? Uh, Lily, you have any question before we begin? Well, I agree with William actually, because I also work full time and I, I'm taking three other classes. So is there is there any way that we can just push one of the assignments to another week, maybe? The assignment, assignment that I do this the next week. Uh-huh. Cause I I also have a lot of work from other classes and it's really hard for me to keep up with everything if I'm just getting more and more homework. And I really, really, really wanna pass all my classes. So I would just appreciate if like some of the assignments or just one at least is pushed to another week. Another week, if you also, you know, that week you're pushing it to, let me show you maybe we haven't gone through the models yet. So here are the models here. Mm -hmm. mm. This is week five, week four. They have the matching quiz and practice quiz for chapter four. Yeah. Now we still have the, the test. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, then chapter five, which is sent the same week four, we have we have your matching quiz and practice quiz. Mm. Now, if, you, if you want me to move it to this week, you see you have matching quiz and practice quiz for that week. That's why yeah. that's, that's you want me to move it to. You see what I mean? So if I move them down, there'll be a lot of more there. And that week you want me to move it to, so this is week five. Yes. It's, the, it's the same week you have your, you're going to have your... Um, oh, I see. I see, we already have a lot of work next week as well. Yeah, so I'm gonna change this date now. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just the way the course is structured because it's a, it's a 12 week class. Okay. I mean, if you want me to move it, if you want me to move it to next week, I can move it, but this, this week, it, 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 it keep adding up to the next one. Yeah, I understand, I understand. Okay, I'll try to work on it. And no, try actually, to it. this, this midterm exam shouldn't be, be here. Mm. We have work that week because you see, you see, you see, chapter five continued. You still have a uh, matching quiz for seven, chapter seven, and matching quiz for uh, practice quiz before we mm. go to week six. So, uh, Mr. Nunez, you there? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, you can see what I'm, I'm saying. So, it, wait, yeah. it, it is arranged in models, and each model. Uh, there are going to be two assignments for each chapter. So if we move the chapter, I mean, it's, it, like I said, if you want me to move it to this, uh, to the first, I can move it, but it's still going to be a lot for you to do it because it keeps adding up. Okay. Yeah. So this meet them, this, this week meet them here, and it's a research paper. So I'm going to, this, this one I can um, move, move away. Um, because it's too close where it is. We haven't gotten to meet them yet. <laughs> okay. So now, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm still gonna, um, yeah, so that's basically what it is. So let's continue. So like I said, this week you have your, um, you're gonna have your, uh, we'll, we'll be covering this chapter four now, and then you just read chapter five then do the quizzes. 
the matching quiz and the practice quiz for chapter five and then self for chapter four. And we continue from there. So um, now, any more questions from any of you before we begin? No. Okay. All right, let's start. So again, again we will, we'll be covering chapter four now, um, which is um, on financial market and systems. The financial markets, um, when you look at this, uh, my PowerPoint, um, and we look at this picture here, our retirement payments. So let me make sure you're seeing this. Yeah. Retirement payments, profits, finance, happiness, wealth, social security. Um, cost, coin, bills, broke. Now, and then I, I can continue. So all these things, stems you see here have something to do with money. And uh, how this money is um, raised and used are basically what the financial system is all about. Now, the financial system when we talk about the financial system, we are, uh, we are referring to that uh, the institutions that, we, that are already in, in place to deal with or facilitate the exchange of money or funds. Institutions like the banks, insurance companies, stock exchanges. So uh, their main role is to um, like I say, is to uh, make sure or that money or fund move uh, between the financial system participants, people like the lenders, investors, and borrowers. Yeah. So now I have a short, a, a small photo of what it looks like. So they have the lenders, then we have the financial intermediaries and then the borrowers. This is what you have in the financial system. So the money go from lenders, sorry, from bank, from the uh, intermediaries to the, um, sorry, from the lenders to the banks. Even banks are also lenders as well. Then from the banks or the intermediaries, financial intermediaries to the borrowers. Now these borrowers pay interest to the financial intermediary, who also pay interest to lenders. The Argentina bank doesn't borrow money. Bank, bank also borrow money too. They borrow from um, the central bank and also from people like us, me, like me and you. They buy, when, when they sell their bonds and then they can lend that money. So they, they can borrow from me or from you or from the uh, central bank. Um, at Let's say that they borrow at uh, at one percent, okay, uh, and then they lend to me and you at three percent, and the profit is for them is two percent. That's how bank makes most of their money. The financial intermediaries. So this system that involves all this, or that facility, make sure that this 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 uh, money flows from lenders to intermediaries to borrowers, and from borrowers back to intermediaries and then to lenders is what the financial system is. So in, in summary, I can say that the financial system permits the exchange of money or allow the exchange of money between the financial uh, market participants, lenders, investors, and then borrowers. So when this, when this system is working very well, you see the economy growing. Because that means that people can, uh, borrowers can have access to cash they need. For, to do their projects. And then they pay back interest to, you know, to the intermediary who also pay the interest to other lenders. And, you know, economy is working smoothly. So when, when economy is working that way, you see jobs just being created and the growth, economic growth and other things that follows it. Now, um, we have, which bring us to the concept of money. So what is money? I mean, we use money every day and um, we don't really 
uh, sometimes don't really uh, bother ourselves about uh, the history behind it. There's a whole lot of history behind money, how we started, started came to where we have, where we have the paper money that is come and I can, can act as the medium of exchange for um, between, between one person and another. So money simply means anything that people use to pay for goods and services. Uh, and also to settle other their other their other obligations. Okay. Now, uh, historically, we have uh, what we call uh, commodity money. Um, where money was taken. To, uh, certain commodities were used as money. Things like salt, stones, beads, silver, and copper coins. Um, so, of course, more recently we have the virtual currency. Now, somebody might be wondering, why, how can a salt be used as money? Well, salt can, I mean, it depends on circumstances. A, a country in a crisis, maybe a political crisis, certain commodities can become scarce, very scarce, that people can then accept them as the medium of exchange. I can give you an example. Uh, the, the Nigerian uh, Civil War in, in uh, 1967 to 1970, the salt was very scarce in the um, eastern part of the country. Very scarce that if you have salt, you can exchange it for, for goods and services. People accept salt as, as a medium of payment during that three years of the war. So that kind of thing can happen uh, uh, during a, a political crisis, especially. So, and then we have stones, bit of gold, silver coin. There was, there was time all these things we have been accepted as currency, as a medium of exchange. Just like today, we have a virtual currency. I'm sure all of you have heard of Bitcoin. When I say virtual currency, I'm, talking, I'm, I'm referring to Bitcoin, which is one of the virtual currencies we have. So now, whatever uh, medium or form that the means money is, it has to have one feature. And that feature is that it needs to be widely accepted by both the buyers and the sellers, uh, you know, as a means of payment. Um, they have to be um, widely accepted. So now, um, uh, we can now look at um, a brief history of how the money it comes about. We begin with, uh, each time we are looking at the history of money, we we'll always start with the butter system. Uh, which simply means uh, the system of exchange that involves, you know, using one good to exchange for another good. Uh, even the services, in some cases, services to exchange for another good. Um, even uh, if we look at the, the some hi historical things that happened in the past, even uh, yeah, I think it was in the I forgot where it was where we, one one can render service. And then in some cultures that pay bright price in those days, um, in some cultures that pay bright price, that what you call bright price. Uh, when you, uh, for example, in African culture, you want to get married, you, you pay what you call bright price. You see, it's part of the culture. There are some people that can, who cannot afford that. There's some places where they can ask for accept labor over the years in lieu of bright price, you know, something like that. Now, that's a form of butter system. So for the butter system, um, we have uh, exchange goods or service for other goods. Uh, now, usually uh, the butter is uh, inefficient for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons why it's inefficient is what you call um, the, um, the double coincidence of ones. Double coincidence of ones. So let me highlight so you can see. So what does this mean? Well, suppose I need um, to buy uh, something like, um, it's a shoe, a pair of shoes. And I want to exchange um, something I have, which might be uh, a DVD player for a pair of shoes. Now, I have to look for somebody who has the pair of shoes that I want and who at the same time needs DVD player. So you have to be two, one, people, it's a double coin, we call it double coins, and two people wanting, I want to use the person wants uh, a DVD player. 
because in my, in my I want shoes. Somebody wants, I want shoes. I might see somebody who, else who wants, they want something different. I want to just to buy um, a, a pack of beer, you know? So you have to figure out somebody who wants that, set, who is looking for what you have. Now, I mean, uh, I'll give you another a typical example. If I want to buy shoes now, I don't have to look for that. I just go to Walmart or go to whatever they sell good shoes, maybe Jesse Penny, and then pay for it and go home. I don't have to look for somebody who wants, who is who has who, who is looking for the DVD to buy from me. So there have to be that double coincidence of want. That is one of, one of the main reasons why the butter system uh, is inefficient. Now, um, now I, I, I give an example here uh, with a hairstylist uh, who want a pair of shoes. And then, so you have to find a shoemaker who also so, um, has a pair of shoes, then the correct size that she wants, and who is willing to accept, uh, you know, hairdo for a pair of shoes. Yeah. So that double coincidence of one is, uh, is very, very, it makes butter system to be very cumbersome um, and very, very inefficient. Now, next thing is the lack of standard for the file payment. Now, it is difficult to borrow uh, and lend uh, in the, on, under the butter system. And also it is, it is hard to engage in contracts that involve, any contract that involve future payments because it's, it, it's good on services. So I, it, it, for me, I can't, I, it is hard for me to say, okay, let me give me give you my shoes. I mean, it, it works some places. They were using it in, uh, for, for years before the, the, the current uh, money system we have came out. Okay, now in my village when I was growing up in the eight in the early early eighties, my village um, that time, if you want to farm a portion of the land belonging to somebody else, you can say, okay, um, let me farm this since you're not since, since the place is barren, you're not, you're not doing anything with it. Let me farm this. So when the crops grow in the future, then we can share the, you know, the harvest, things like that. And at a point, people will actually pay, uh, like there's some crops that, uh, that have uh, mature in two years. So people can always can, can even switch land. Okay, if you're not using this land for this, I'm, I'm gonna use this land. Uh, let me use it for, for to grow cassava then you can now share the proceed as a means of payment. Yeah. But of course, the person that owned the land, you get a bigger portion. It will it, it basically, basically between you and him to or her to decide how you're gonna share the um, uh, the harvest, okay? Now, that was a long time ago. But now, uh, um, the one I witnessed, the one I just explained to you is the one that I was told. But the one I witnessed was was not completely a better system. It was like uh, you pay the owner of the land so that they can farm in that land uh, for a year or two years, uh, something like that. But in a better system, the, the, where, where there's the lack of, the, there's no standard means of payment. If I say, okay, I'm gonna pay you with uh, with the um, harvest of um, maybe of eggs, Next two, next two years, eggs can't stay that long. They will, they will, you know, expire. You know, expire. So there's no standard means of payment, and because of that, future payment or lending is difficult. Now, in my, uh, there are some villages or there are some countries in those days where people can borrow. Somebody that doesn't have want to usually have to do with farming, that doesn't have a, a, a crops or seeds to plant. They can borrow from somebody who has it. I said, yeah, borrow from that person. And then they have an agreement as you keep harvesting over the years, you keep returning the, you know, the some of the harvest as means of payment. So all this thing takes a long time. It may, in fact, it was so, um, it wasn't um, easy. And, and like, like I say, it makes the better system very complex. Another one is this lack of um, a common me measure of value. Uh, in the, but I wrote here that in the butter system, there is no common measure of value. Even if the buyer and seller 
of each other commodities happen to meet, the problem always arises as the proportion of the two goods to be exchanged. And I'll give you an example. I want to buy a shoe. And of course, when you want to buy a shoe, for example, you know you have test in shoes. And then according to the, um, the quality of the shoes, the price, you know, the value goes up, you know. Now, I have the, the, um, the DVD player that I want to exchange. Then let somebody have the shoes. What quantity of shoes will that person exchange with my DVD player? Is it two pairs or three pairs? And then, of course, I'm, I'll, I'll be willing to accept two pairs or three pairs for a DVD player, depending on the quality of the shoes. But then, will that person be willing to accept only one DVD player for two pairs of shoes? So you can see the problem now. So the absence of a common denominator in order to express the exchange ratios creates a lot of uh, problem for the better system. So now, money is came as the, 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 the rescuer, something that rescued us from all this um, problem with the better system. Now, any question before I continue? Hello? Any questions so far, I class? I don't have any questions. Uh, this is Lynn. I don't have any questions, Professor, but um, we, on one of the chapters, we were reading about culture and the effect of culture and customs. I think that was chapter two um, or modular two about how people, different people view different things. And one thing that I found now that we're talking about Barber, um, Bar um, I was at the, um, I lived on Yale's campus, Yale University, and they have their own postal service there. And there was always a big, huge, long line. I mean, just, to, and it's a lot of time consuming because people are often sending packages internationally. So that's time consuming. And I, with the whole, I was, the line was even longer than normal. It was out in the street. And I was like, why is this line so long? I mean, it's normally long. And the reason why there was a woman um, from a foreign country trying to barter at the price down to send her package to her home, her homeland, and she, because the prices were listed on the on the screen there as to how much it was going to cost, and she really thought that she could barter down the price, and she was holding up everybody while she used her customs, her thoughts, her societal norms to try to barter down the price at the postal service. The price is what it is; it's not going to change. So this is very, <laughs> this is very interesting to me that you're covering this subject in this way, in light of what we already learned. So, so in, in that case, he's, uh, she's not battering because um, she's not exchanging. A, is she, does she want to exchange something for the price or, or she no. wants to, want to bring the price down? She wanted to bar, she wanted to, I guess barter means exchange one item for another item. So she wasn't trying yeah. to change another item for another item in the sense that she well, was she trying to the price down. Yes, yeah, so and she was trying to, but she was trying to barter in the sense of the amount of cash that she wanted to put out so for how much price down. Okay, bargaining. She's bargaining. Yes, bargaining. Okay. Yes, yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 that kind of thing still happens in some countries. Uh, if you have the price of something, then somebody wants to bid it down. Uh, it's okay. Can you, see, if you have, let's say the price is twenty dollars, you can say, okay, can I pay you ten dollars? Then you say no, okay, okay, bring okay, bring fifteen dollars. It will going back and forth. I I know what you mean. <laughs> that one is bargaining. For uh for butter, you have to say okay. I, can I give you something else in, in exchange for that? It has to be good one good over uh for the another good. <laughs> so butter never involves money then. No, no. but butter is uh, exchange of goods with another okay. goods. So it, it, it was it's the system being used before the money system, the current money system came out. So I want uh, shoes. I have to look for somebody who wants shoes and who is willing to exchange my shoes for, I mean, his shoes for my DVD player or something else. You know. So that's the better system. Something, something that is close to it a little bit in US is um, the, um, 
pawn shop, pawn shop. But then pawn is borrowing. You give something to, to borrow money. Am I right? Not really. So, uh, because okay. at a pawn and yeah. at a pawn shop, you're giving us a good to get money. You're not giving a good to get another good. Yes, yeah, that's why I say that is only thing that is uh, look a little bit similar to butter. For butter, you give a good for another good. So it's you've been using the you know a long time ago, um, not anymore. Uh, now, nah, but uh, that was a system of uh, exchange before the money system came out. Mm. So uh, the one is the, the one is the, you describe is the bargaining. <laughs> Are trying to bargain the price down. Yeah. So, um, you have any other question? Miss Jenkins, you have any other, any other, any other uh, No, you know? sir, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Now, so in under the better system, you money is um, uh, um, um, services, other services or good is exchanged for another good. Now. There's a there's in, in some way it is being done in uh, among countries they call it counter trade. Now, a poor country might want you know some maybe it depends on what is uh, the higher what they want. Maybe they need to buy um a manufactured goods, they don't have it, they don't have the money to pay for it, but they have something like uh, natural resources that do you do so. I'll give you an example. It, it, it used to happen between um, before be, before Venezuela collapsed, the economy, before their before their, uh, their economy collapsed, it used to happen between Cuba, Cuba and Venezuela. Cuba is a poor country now, but they have one of the best doctors in the world, medical doctors. So they exchange with Venezuela to supply them to some amount of uh, um, oil, crude oil that they, they, uh, they can use to make you know gas, and then they send. The medical doctors to Venezuela. Uh, it, it used to it used to be, be like that for for Cuba and Venezuela for many years before the the Venezuelan uh, economy collapsed. So that is a some kind of a barter system, but at the national level we call it counter trade. Yeah. So it happens sometimes. Although it also happened in Iraq once uh, uh, when uh, during the um, Iraq Iraqi uh, war, then Saddam Hussein. Um, the the world he wanted to buy medicine and other supplies for the for the refugees, uh, but because of the sanctions that was given to him uh, by the world due to his uh, you know uh, the, some of some of the things that he, he was doing at that time, they gave him sanctions that he couldn't buy so many things easily. So now, and at the same time, United States and other countries that like give the sanction does not um, want to giving the money. So what they do, because they, they feel that if they give the money to Saddam Hussein, he's going to use that money to buy weapons, more weapons. So um, so I, I, don't know, I don't know if you have had this, uh, let me type it here so you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Maybe, maybe after the class, you can, you can Google it. All year, it's called All Year for Food program. So this, so the United Nations, now they have this deal, okay, we supply you the food and the medicine that you need for the refugees in your country. In return, they now get they get some oil from Saddam Hussein. So that's a kind of butter system. But again, at the national level, they call it the counter, you know, counter trade. Now, but at the at the individual level, it doesn't it, it doesn't exist as the main means of payment that it used to be. Now I can decide to exchange my house for car, or whatever, but that is not the means of payment. So it's, uh, now it's not, it's not the norm. Norm is to pay with with money, uh, because because money when it came out, uh, because of the efficiency that is uh, at, uh, attributed to the money system, it quickly replaced the butter system. Yeah. Now um, <clears throat> the functions of money. Money uh, have uh, many functions, but um, the main one that uh, that main one that is the core function. Include the medium of exchange. We money serve as the medium of exchange, um, which means that um, it is an intermediary between the buyer and the seller. Now, unlike before the uh, before the money system came out, 
I want to, let's say I want to buy a pen now. And what I have is a, um, a can of, or, or soda that I have, I want to use to buy a pen. I have to look for somebody, go around the neighborhood, somebody who wants a pen, sorry, who have a pen, the type that I have, and who is willing to accept my soda. And then now we can decide the prices, bargain prices, like you, you, you explained, Miss Lynn. I can say, I can, I can give you two cans of soda for one pen. You say, no, I want three cans of soda for one pen. No, that's going to be back and forth beginning until you guys come out and agree. But now I don't have to do all that. Get the money, go to the store, buy the pen and come back. So that medium of exchange, that's what money serves now as the medium of exchange. Now, next one is the store of value. Money doesn't expire. I mean, the value might go down um, as time because of the inflation. Uh, I, 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 the, if the... If you look at if you if you look at the prices of things for the past ten years, or you can see that um, what something things cost more today than they cost ten years ago or even twenty years ago. So that shows you that the value of money uh, declines little by little in a, in an economy where the uh, financial system is working. Now, how why because of the inflation and of course the other things uh, interest rate. That, that's why that's one of the reasons why. Um, I'm not a fan of uh, minimum wage. But in any case, that's beside the point. The fact that money, even though its value goes down a little bit, because it goes down a little, it doesn't go down so quick. I, it can use it to store money, I mean, to store value. Now, the retirement account we have, people have, as they are working, with their working age, they set up a retirement account, the IRA, the 401k. And then, so that one actually, because of the fact that it is an investment, Instead of the value going down, it keeps going up. I mean, assuming that there is no crisis. So that when you retire, and then you're no longer working, you can start getting payments. So you can see, you can, for the fact that it can stay up to 20 years, mean that you can store your, 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 the, the, the money in things like that, even in asset, real asset, and the state. Now, there's no other means of exchange that, uh, uh, like uh, they say that the better system, for example, I don't know any um, Apple that can stay for 10 years as a means of storing value. I don't know, if, if, even a vehicle that you drive, a car, if you buy a car today, as a matter of fact, as soon as you are driving out of the dealership, the value starts to, to decline. 10 years later, a car that you bought for, for $30,000, 10, 10 years later, we don't want that anymore. But if you invest thirty thousand dollars, even if you put it, even if you put it in, a, in a savings account that will have some interest payment, depending on the bank, the value even it will still be growing, even though that uh, depending on the the uh, rate of interest. But the thing that you can store your try for a while, you can store your money for one year, you can sell it for two years, you can sell it for three years, so it become a store of value, unlike the butter system, where goods and services. Are not used are used for uh, as a store of value. Now there are um, some commodities that can serve as a store of value, even though they have money. But they are near money. Things like um, gold can value of gold goes up. Have been going up for a, for a long time. Um, but gold, what for, for but for some time gold was used as money. Not as a, you know you can use gold to buy exchange any goods, depending on um, what uh, the agreement between you and the, uh, the other person. So as a store of value, money is not unique. Uh, like I say, many things like land, work of art. Like if, like if you see a work of art by Picasso, you're gonna what, some of them are worth even millions. Uh, and we have uh, um, money can even depreciate um, due to inflation sometimes. That is why whenever they see, if you, love, if you watch the stock market, and the economy, if the, if the stocks are down, you see good, good price go up because people will flock into good because it, do, it can be serve as a better, better store of value at that particular time, uh, point in time. But other commodities that we used to exchange, uh, for, uh, uh, shirt for shoe, um, uh, bottle of wine for something else, they don't store value as much as money. And of course, when you put that money in stock, if things goes well for you, the value will even be bigger. 
by the time it, 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 it premature. Now, another one is that it is a unit of account by providing a measure of the value of goods and services that will be exchanged. Um, so if I want to buy five pairs of shoes, I just get the money, look at the price, get the money for five pairs of shoes and go and buy it, come back. I don't have to, but if I have a DVD player, like they do in, uh, in better system, <coughs> excuse me, for a DVD player, you have to look for somebody who can who can accept so so and so number of DVD player for so so and so number of shoes. So there's no really unit of exchange. It depends on how much the person needs the DVD player and how much you need the shoes. But money, you just how much is the price? You calculate the money for the price, go pay the price, and come back. So it is um is it a it's a unit of account. That you have a image of value. Now, let's look at the functions. Now, functions acceptability. Acceptability. So, it must be widely accepted as a method of payment um, in the market for goods and services. Now, the US dollar, for example, is accepted worldwide anywhere as a means of payment. As a matter of fact, there are some countries that you go and you want to pay. Uh, buy something and pay for pay for those goods, and you give them dollar. They even accept more dollar uh, in, in 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 more than their own currency because of the nature of the, the value of their currency. A good country, a good example. Uh, places like uh, we have country like uh, um, Venezuela. We have also uh, Zimbabwe. But these two places I mentioned, they used to have a, a very um, currency crisis. So in that case, um, the money, the asset money that have value, US dollar or even the pound, in the money. In, in case of uh, uh, Zimbabwe, the one that happened in, I think in 2008, around that time when they had a currency crisis, it was so bad that the, their currency, the, the um, Zimbabwean dollar, I think they, I think the Zimbabwean dollar they use, the value went so, so low that no, people don't accept it anymore. Like if you go to the store, let, uh, let me to give you a typical example. Come to a restaurant, for example, and the price of the meal is uh, $5. Before you finish ordering, the price has already risen to $10. Before you can sit down and start eating. So at the end of the day, by the time you finish the meal, you pay more than that, times three or times two that, that uh, amount that it was originally uh, about the price priced. So it's a, it's a, it was a type of hyperinflation. So nobody, many places, they don't accept it anymore. They have to, uh, at the point, they started accepting um, properties in, in, in favor of money. And it, it, can, it can happen anywhere. It happened in Germany. When they were, I think they are using a, something, uh, Max. So it was so bad that even to buy a, a postage stamp, you might have like hundreds of thousands of German Max. To pay for one stamp, one book of stamp. So workers, uh, let me play this. Uh, let me. I think I, ha I have the video uh, for you here. Um, let me see if I can open the. See if I have the video for the one that happened in Germany. Hyperinflation in Germany. Uh, let me see. Okay. Finance videos. Oh, you know what? Let me type videos. So, um, I have this one here. Wait, let's let me open this one. I want to play so you can see. Sometimes money cannot be accepted, but will not be widely accepted. Yeah. So, uh, I think I have. Hyper inflation, last one minute. Yep, I got it. Okay. Can you hear the, can you hear the sound?
Can you hear the sound? Uh, not really. Not yet. I'm gonna move this so I can. Okay, I got it. All right. Share sound, share computer sound. Yeah. And let me put it again. About the prices constantly going up. Can you hear it now? Yes. Okay. Now. Okay, good. This one is going to happen in Germany. Okay. Then you might want to watch this video about one of the most unbelievable cases of hyperinflation in history. That is hyperinflation in Germany in the 1920s, where at some point prices doubled almost every four days. Hyperinflation occurs when the inflation rate increases very rapidly, resulting in prices going up very fast and the currency losing its value quickly. One of the most amazing hyperinflation cases in history happened in Germany in the 1920s. As the result of World War I, the German paper mark started to lose its value, and this process accelerated in the 1920s. In 1923, prices eventually ran out of control. The prices went up so much that people were forced to spend billions of marks for daily items and were dizzied by the amount of zeros involved. As an example, a loaf of bread which cost 250 marks in January 1923 rose to 200,000 million marks in November of 1923. Or a newspaper that was sold for one mark in May 1922 had a price tag of 70 million marks in November 1923. It was cheaper to use the back of a 1 million mark to write notes as a notepad would cost billions of marks. Some had to use wheelbarrows filled with cash to get a cup of coffee. At restaurants, customers had to negotiate the price of the food in advance, as there was a good chance that the price could change before the meal was served. Most restaurants did not print menus, as by the time the food would arrive, the price had already gone up. At some point, the situation got so bad that the prices were doubling almost every four days. There is evidence that it was cheaper to burn marks instead of wood or coal. Some used marks instead of wallpaper to decorate their walls. Children also used bundles of marks instead of toy bricks. Workers also had to negotiate their wages almost on a daily basis. Some had to use a scale to count the weight of their money to get its value, as it was difficult to count all the bills. Workers were paid twice a day so they could spend the money quickly before it lost its value. Many collected their wages in suitcases. One person who left his suitcase unattended found that the thief had stolen the suitcase but not the money. After collecting their wages, workers would quickly rush to either buy daily goods or pass the money to their family so that they'd spend it before its value had gone down. The German government eventually managed to stabilize the situation by taking a number of initiatives, including cutting 12 zeros from the paper mark and replacing it with a new currency called Rettenmark. However, the economic pressure on the Germans eventually contributed to the rise of the Nazi party that used Germans' dire economic situation to attract public support and eventually gain power. Yeah, so you can see, um, so at that point, when the currency loses its value, like that, to that extent, it's no longer be accepted. It becomes, the acceptability will, will decline, will decrease so much. But when it still have value, it will be accepted. Or you know, so the problem is one of the functions that it has to be acceptable. Means document. I want it is um, any comment on the video. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah, it, happened. It's, it happened in Germany and it happened recently in Venezuela, uh, in, in um, Zimbabwe. 2008, 2008. Then it's happening now in Venezuela. At the point, mm -hmm. it, uh, it usually happens with, for some reason, maybe political crisis. And I think in Venezuela case is Bolivar they use. But it went down so yeah. much. Yeah, and, the I'm sorry. The story, um, 
that um, I read about, because I'm a big fan of history, the story that I ran uh, was that you would go to work and bring somebody to work with you in Germany at this time, after the war, after World War One, And when you would pay right then and there, you would turn the money over to the person that you came with, like your wife. She would run to the market, get yeah. the food, and bring the food back to you. Then you, And at lunchtime, you would pay it again. And you'd have your wife or whoever with you. You get your pay. She'd run to the market <laughs> before, before, before the value, you know. Yes, you exactly. And by the end of the day, you would pay like she said two times, but I remember it was paid three times for each one. At the end of the day, you were paid and you ran again. And I mean, it, it was just like like William said, it was just crazy. But it's yeah. also kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, it happened, it, it happened. And the, that kind of currency, and if some if you're in another country. And if somebody wants to pay you that kind of currency, in the, uh, or to pay you with uh, something like a US dollar or uh, British pound, you they will accept the pound or dollar, if, and they won't accept their own currency. So it happens uh, in every, in, you know, any uh, whatever the uh, economy is, uh, financial system is, or it can be due to even due to a government policy. Yeah. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um. When I was a little girl, so this has been a while ago, Britain devalued the pound, its pound. And that was big, big news. I didn't understand what the big deal was, but it was quite shocking that they devalued, devalued the pound. Does that mean that they, would that have helped the people in Germany um, eliminate this problem or no? What does, what did, I don't quite understand what they did in order to, devaluing the pound. The pound is their unit of like the equivalent of the dollar, of course. So would that have helped Germany deal with this problem or no? Devaluing the, 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 the marks will not help Germany in that time because it's already devalued. That's what is called inflation. So what they did, what don't you know, they, uh, because what, the, at that point, their currency is so much, it is no longer scarce. One of the qualities of money is that it has to be scarce. So, but in that case, the value has gone down so much, it is no longer scarce. You saw on the, on the video whereby somebody forgot his bag full of money and a thief came and stole the bag and left the money. <laughs> you see? So, so what the German, German, Germany did that time was to change the international currency from, I think, from something mass to Deutschmark. So Deutschmark became scarce and then became, it became valued, valued, valued again. You see? It became scarce and then some of the value, of course, they, of course, there are, there are other things that they did to make it, uh, you know, uh, national uh, the, the currency to become. Uh, but, but, but once you change the national currency to another currency, that new currency becomes scarce, and with the scarcity comes the value. Uh, now, so that that's what Germany did. Then plus other things that they did, uh, you know, revamping their economy. Now, to answer your question about British pound, why they devalue the pound? There are similar, there are many reasons. So if their value, if the value of their currency is like, so high, that means uh, it becomes like it can make your goods and services to cost more. That means if your currency is so the value is so high, that means for me to pay for a lawyer, the British lawyer to defend me, it will cost me more than for me to pay a Nigerian lawyer to defend me. See, so that will move business away from the from the from your economy. You see what I'm, so now to make your, 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 your economy more attractive or more competitive, you might, there are, there are other, of course, there are other, other we have, we, we, if in, um, in a, my economics class, I, I can go more elaborate on this. Now, there are other reasons for, for an economy to devalue their currency, uh, but usually to make their market more, their, their goods more uh, competitive in the, in the world market and so, and so many other factors. So they did devalue it because at a point the British pound is so so value is so high that you can't do business with a, in a British company because of the exchange rate. You see what I mean? You can't pay. For yes. The, yeah. So thank you. It. You're welcome. Yeah. So now next one was it must be divisible. So I, I remember when I, I remember when I was explaining the butter system, I want a pair of shoes. How many DVDs will I exchange for a pair of shoes? I want, yeah, dependent. So now, suppose I don't want a uh, complete, somebody doesn't want it, he just want to, to watch DVD. He doesn't want to complete DVD. You know what I mean? So you just want to watch DVD maybe for a day. 
You cannot exchange it for, for a pair of shoes. So there's no way of decreasing, divising, dividing the uh, level of transaction. So that's what money gave us. Now, if I want a can of soda, I, I exchange $5 and buy a can of soda for $1. I don't, I don't have to buy the complete pack or the pan if, that, if that's not what I want. So money offers us the ability to divide transaction into smaller quantities, yeah, depending on our needs. Yeah. Now, you know, we do all these things without even thinking about it, how, how the, um, this, this, this important properties of money, until if the economy is in a crisis, like a country at war or political crisis like you have in Venezuela, then, then, then you start seeing what you are enjoying without even thinking about it, <laughs> you know. Anyway, I don't want that it must be portable. Um, it, it must be easy to be carried from one place to the other. Of course, many, most currencies are, have that by, uh, quality. Then it must be durable. I mean, I can put a, a US dollar in your wallet for 10 years. You can still bring it out and use it because it's durable. And so long as it is not a counterfeit, you know. And next is that it must be difficult to counterfeit. So if, if, the, more, if the currency can be, you know, fake, the fake currency can be easily uh, made, at the point it will be, it will affect the value because um, people we always look at, uh, you know, be, be leery about accepting that currency because of the number of fake floating around. Uh, so now, which leads us to what is called commodity versus fiat money. Now, commodity money um, uh, consists of objects like, um, uh, has value, things like uh, gold, antique dollars, even uh, silver. And uh, in, um, in, in, um, um, I think in Israel, they use what they call shekels. So those things have, uh, come on, have to, but now shekels is now in notes, but it, it, Israeli shekels. But so those at the point, those, those are, those are uh, there are two different commodities that can be used as money. Even uh, there was a point where I think, um, I think around the time you were talking about before the British devalued, devalued the pound, there was, it was a time that each country's currency was backed by gold. So if a country have um, 200 million, pounds or 200 million dollars that means that they have in their reserve quantity of gold that is worth that same amount so they are tied it to the gold and uh, we call it the gold standard in the, but, but then that's not our topic today to here is have them um, now um we have commodity money, but there's what they call fiat money like the, the, the one you use uh the u.s dollar like that and that is it's not backed by gold the, the current British pound, many currencies are not, are not bad by gold anymore because it's, it affects the rate of business transaction. Because if you have this um, $200,000, uh, uh, but you don't have the equivalent in the number of gold, uh, how can we exchange it? You are limited to the amount of business you can do as a country, since you cannot back up your currency with the same quantity of gold. Yeah. But now, you don't need that. So it is bad by whatever the country, the, 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 the trust in the country's uh, uh, monetary system. So we call that one the um, fiat money or what we call the legal tender. So the legal tender for US is uh, the dollar. Legal tender for Britain is uh, France, sorry, uh, pounds. Legal tender for Venezuela is Bolivar. Legal tender for Nigeria is Naira. So these are, these are the, the only thing that they, they make them have value is their is the just by government fiat. The, the government write this note is the legal tender for all debts, public, public and private. So that means you are obliged to accept it as a means of payment. Because if you use it to pay for somebody else, they also will accept it. That backing by government, uh, you know, fiat is what make it uh, money. Not that it's bad by gold or silver or whatever. So we call that kind of money fiat money or the legal tender. Questions? Any question? I don't have any questions. Me neither. Let's. How about you? No, neither do I. Now, um, 
they have um, the alternatives to traditional currency. We have uh, other alternatives, and uh, these days we have so many of them. Uh, fine tech have given us so many things that we can use. But traditionally, we have the, the checks, the credit cards, uh, debit cards, and the prepared debit cards. These are alternatives to you know to the traditional currency. But now there are many other things came out. Um, uh, innovative options uh, brought by technology. We have the what we call them smartphone enabled credit card acquires things like uh square you know the cash app you all know about cash app right hello hello everyone do you, you you have to know about cash app am i right not real not really yeah. professor oh cash app is um cash app is a means of payment now that they use now you know that um if you want to pay not really to buy things in the store, but you can use it to settle, you know, uh, your obligations or to make transfer. In fact, then the transfer. Let's say that you owe me or I owe you uh, twenty dollars, and you you have the cash app, the app installed in your uh, smartphone, and have the app. I can transfer twenty dollars to from my account to your account. It will go right away, right away. You know, you know, regular transfer takes like uh, a day or two days to clear. Am I right? Even if, even if you make payment with a check, it takes like two or three days to clear. Am I right or wrong? Yes. Now with Cash App, as I send, if I, once you have, so long as you have the app and I have the app, when I send the money to you, now it will go now to your account. You see it right away. Now you can. So you take, so you're taking money out of my, I take money out of my bank account via the app and transport it to your um, bank account via the app? So from the app, from my app, if, if, I'm, if I'm the one making the payment, for example, and you have the, you have, I'll ask you, do you have Cash App? You say yes. You, you give me a Cash App uh, ID. Then with that alone, cash, your Cash App ID is usually your name with a dollar sign or your email or your phone number, you know, your KBI. So once you give it to me, I'll now send the money from my app to your app. $20. Then, when it comes to you, you can then cash it out. You can say, okay, if I want to cash the money out right away, you press on the a button, and then it will deposit in your bank account instantly. <laughs> so does this cash out operate a fee for doing this or no? If you want the deposit to, if you want it to be deposited now, it might charge you maybe one percent, or one dollar, or something, depending on size. If, it, for example, if it is like sixty dollars, for example, it might charge you a dollar. And if you deposit it in your account right away. Hmm. Now, if it is less than, if you want it to deposit, let's say to tomorrow, then it might not charge you anything. Just yeah. Now there are there are, there are many of them. That's one they call Zelle. Have you heard of Zelle? That one Bank of, Bank of America uses that one a lot. If you have a Bank of America account, you probably have a Zelle. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, the same thing. If I have a Zelle, and you have a Zelle, if I'm using my email as my Zelle ID. I can give you all my phone number. I can give it to you. Okay, you can make pay me, pay me for my services. Um, how much? Forty dollars. I give you my Zelle email. You you go to your Zelle, log into your Bank of America account. Do for the, that email I gave you. Type it in. It will pull my name my name up. Then you can also okay send forty dollars. If you send it right away to your account, that one doesn't need any charge. You know, as long as you have the Zelle, you come to your that, the account that is associated with the cell app, you know? So these are the new things that are coming out, you know? And for, um, we, we, we the immigrants that came, uh, we, we normally we, not, we send money home, you know, you know to dependent relatives. Uh, sometimes we, we go to the, we had to go to Western Union some time ago. Uh, they say, I'm talking about like five years ago, even four, six, seven years ago, you have to go to Western Union, where they do Western Union, and then stay in the line, Fill the form, can, you know. But now, there are, there are so many apps that came out. You send the money, it goes right to the person's bank account in the because after you finish, after you are done with Western Union and pay, usually if you are sending something like uh, ten hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, you pay like commission of uh, nine dollars. Yeah. Then when they get to that country, 
that person still have to go to the bank and fill some forms and stay in the line before, you know. But now, you send the money with some apps that came out. There are many of them now. That money will go to, the person will just give you his phone number and the bank account number. That's it. So they, they don't even have to go to the bank anymore. It will go straight to the account. And the, the good thing is that they even charge less than Western Union. So uh, technology is bringing out different kind of uh, alternative currency, you know, uh, for uh, means of payment too, as well. There's one called the uh, paper. You all know about paper now, right? What is it? Paper. Oh, yes, I use it a lot. So, yeah, so people, a lot of, many people use, uh, use that. I think it's one of the first ones that came out, it became very popular. And then many, many versions of it started coming out to our land, so on and so forth. So I wrote here that in the United States, 80% of payments are cashless as of 2011. And also, unlike the traditional currency, um, such as um, some alternatives do not derive their value from the government fiat. So the government um, had not established their legitimacy. So in other words, each, as each of these uh, um, uh, method of payments, like uh, the PayPal or the uh, Cash App, Zelle, evolve a network. And within that network, you know, monetary transaction can be uh, uh, done. Now, which brings us to the one that we call the virtual or cryptocurrency. Now, a cryptocurrency is a form of digital currency. Uh, you have, like I said, you have a Bitcoin, very popular now and very, very volatile, very volatile. Because it, um, last, I think last week alone, the rate of ups and down in Bitcoin is almost like 13% up or 20% up and down. You can be rich today and poor next day. And it's, it's, so, it's, it's one of the uh, current asset, financial assets. I don't that I don't really understand what uh, uh, what is going on there. It's rising. You don't know why it is rising <laughs> because it's just digital. It's not. Uh, it's not even. A, it's, it's not even like. A, it's not even like a credit card. It's just digital currency. Anyway, let me show you. Put you uh, um, play a short video on so that you can see why it is called a Bitcoin and and sometimes they call it a cryptocurrency or uh, blockchain, it, it is based on blockchain technology. So um, let me play this video so you can uh, see what it's all about. All about. The Bitcoin, and the crypto but you have heard of the uh, Bitcoins, right? Sorry? You have heard of yes. Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin. yes, Bitcoin, I've heard of Bitcoin. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. a very popular number, but uh, like I said, I don't, it's one, it's one of the, uh, asset, I don't uh, really understand why it is, um, what makes it tick. Let's see. I have Ethereum actually. Oh, you have it? Ethereum. It's, it's, a type it's of another Bitcoin. coin. It's another coin like. I guarantee it will be the biggest financial mistake so, of your life. Say, um, My name is. Uh, uh, what is it called again? The. My coin is. Um, Ethereum is kind of like like, Bitcoin, right? Yeah, it is a Bitcoin. Yeah, because there, there are many types. Of, there have many of them now. Um, yes. The, the, why it goes up, why it goes down. That is something I don't. I never yeah. get. I never had the time to study it very, very well. Am I right? right? Sometimes you are rich, then sometimes you are down. Am I right, Mister Nunes? Yes. Sometimes <laughs> I have more money. Sometimes it goes down, and all that it goes up, down. And it can go down very fast. And yeah. it can also rise very fast. Yeah. <laughs> so, let me play this so it's you can see. Um, you can hear the sound. Can you hear the sound? Yes. 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 Say there's a coin that's currently worth hundreds of US dollars, but it's not made of gold or platinum or any precious I metal. See the in fact, video. it's not the kind of I coin you can hold in your hand. I, I, see just the video. I, I cannot see the video. I just hear it. Oh, now I see it.
Say there's a coin that's currently worth hundreds of US dollars, but it's not made of gold or platinum or any precious metal. In fact, it's not the kind of coin you can hold in your hand or stick in a piggy bank. It's a digital currency, which means it only exists electronically. I'm talking about Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't work like most money. It isn't attached to a state or government, so it doesn't have a central authority or regulatory power. Basically, that means there's no organization deciding when to make more Bitcoins, figuring out how many to produce, keeping track of where they are, or investigating fraud. So how does Bitcoin work as a currency, or have any value at all? Well, Bitcoin wouldn't exist without a whole network of people and a little thing called cryptography. In fact, it's sometimes described as the world's first cryptocurrency. And here's how it works. Bitcoin is a fully digital currency, and you can exchange Bitcoins between computers in a worldwide peer-to-peer -peer network. The whole point of most peer-to-peer -peer networks is sharing stuff, like letting people make copies of super legal music or movies to download. If Bitcoin is a digital currency, what's stopping you from making a bunch of counterfeit copies and becoming fabulously wealthy? Well, unlike an MP3 or a video file, a Bitcoin isn't a string of data that can be duplicated. A Bitcoin is actually an entry on a huge global ledger called the blockchain, for reasons we'll get to in a minute. The blockchain records every Bitcoin transaction that has ever happened. And as of late 2016, the complete ledger is about 107 gigabytes of data. So when you send someone Bitcoins, it's not like you're sending them a bunch of files. Instead, you're basically writing the exchange down on that. Excuse me, uh, I want to make a comment on what you just said. See, 107 gigabytes. It is, it is that it was for 2016. It is much, much bigger than that now gigabytes of data. So when you send someone bitcoins, it's not like you're sending them a bunch of files. Instead, you're basically writing the exchange down on that big ledger, something like Michael sends Hank five bitcoins. Now, maybe you're thinking, but wait, you said that Bitcoin doesn't have a central authority to keep track of everything. Even though the blockchain is a central record, there's no official group of people who update the ledger and keep track of everybody's money like a bank does. It's decentralized. In fact, anybody can volunteer to keep the blockchain up to date with all the new transactions, and a ton of people do. It all works because there are lots of people keeping track of the same thing to make sure all transactions are accurate. Like, imagine you're playing a game of poker with some pals, but none of you have poker chips and you left your cash at home. There's no money on the table, so a few of you get out some notebooks books and start writing down who bets how much, who wins, and who loses. You don't completely trust anyone else, so everyone keeps their ledgers separately. At the end of every hand, you all compare what you've written down. That way, if someone makes a mistake or tries to cheat and snag some extra money for themselves, that discrepancy is caught. After a couple of hands, you might fill up a page of your notebook with notes about the money movement. You can think of each page as a block of transactions. Eventually, your notebook will have pages and pages of information, a chain of those blocks. Hence blockchain. Now, if thousands of people are separately maintaining the Bitcoin blockchain, how are all the ledgers kept in sync? To stick with our poker analogy, think of the entire Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network as a really huge poker table with millions of people. Some are just exchanging money, but lots of volunteers are keeping ledgers. So when you want to send or receive money, you have to announce it to everyone at the table, so the people keeping track can update their ledgers. So for every transaction, you're announcing a couple of things to the Bitcoin network. Your account number, the account number of the person you're sending Bitcoins to, and how many Bitcoins you want to send. And all of the users who are keeping copies of the blockchain will add your transaction to the current block. Having a bunch of people keep track of transactions seems like a pretty good security measure. But if all it takes to send bitcoins is a couple of account numbers, that seems like it might be a security problem. It's a huge problem with regular money. Just think of all the ways criminals try to steal other people's credit card information. And with Bitcoin, there's no central bank to notice anything weird going on to shut down fraud, like if it looked like suddenly you spent your entire life savings on beef jerky. So what's stopping Hank from pretending he's me and just sending himself all of my Bitcoins? Bitcoins are kept pretty safe thanks to cryptography, which is why it's considered a cryptocurrency. Specifically, Bitcoin stays secure because of keys, which are basically chunks of information that can be used to make mathematical guarantees about messages, like, hey, this is really from me. When you create an account on the Bitcoin network, which you might have heard called a wallet, that account is linked to two unique keys, a private key and a public key. In this case, the private key can take some data and basically mark it, also known as signing it, so that other people can verify those signatures later if they want. So let's say I want to send a message to the network that says, Michael sends three Bitcoins to Olivia. I sign that message using my private key, which only I have access to and nobody else can replicate. Then I send that signed message 
message out to the Bitcoin network, and everyone can use my public key to make sure my signature checks out. That way, everyone keeping track of all the Bitcoin trading knows to add my transaction to their copy of the blockchain. In other words, if the public key works, that's proof that the message was signed by my private key and is something I wanted to send. Unlike a handwritten signature or a credit card number, this proof of identity isn't something that can be faked by a scam artist. The who part of each transaction is obviously important to make sure the right people are swapping Bitcoins, but the when matters as well. If you had $1,000 in your bank account, for example, and tried to buy two things for $1,000 each, the bank would honor the first purchase and deny the second one. If the bank didn't do that, you'd be able to spend the same money multiple times. Which might sound awesome, but it's also terrible. A financial system can't work like that because no one would get paid. So if I only have enough money to pay Olivia or Hank, but I try to pay them both, there's a check built into the Bitcoin system. Both the Bitcoin network and your wallet automatically check your previous transactions to make sure you have enough Bitcoins to send in the first place. But there's another problem that might happen with timing. Because lots of people are keeping copies of the blockchain all over the world, network delays means that you won't always receive the transaction requests in the same order. So now you've got a bunch of people with a bunch of slightly different blocks to pick from, but none of them are necessarily wrong. Okay, Bitcoin, how do you solve that problem? It turns out it's by actually solving problems. Math problems. To add a block of transactions to the chain, each person maintaining a ledger has to solve a special kind of math problem created by a cryptographic hash function. A hash function is an algorithm that takes an input of any size and turns it into an output with a fixed size. For example, let's say you had this string of numbers as your input, and our example hash function says to add all of the numbers together. So in this case, the output would be 10. What makes hash functions really good for cryptography is that when you're given an input, it's really easy to find the output, but it's really hard to take an output and figure out the original input. Even in this super simple example, there are lots of strings of numbers that add up to 10. The only way to figure out that the input was 1, 2, 3, 4 is to just guess until you get it right. Now the hash function that Bitcoin uses is called SHA-256, which stands for Secure Hash Algorithm 256-bit, and it was originally developed by the United States National Security Agency. Computers that were specifically designed to solve SHA-256 hash problems take, on average, about 10 minutes to guess the solution to each one. That means they're churning through billions and and billions of guesses before they get it right. Whoever solves the hash first gets to add the next block of transactions to the blockchain, which then generates a new math problem that needs to be solved. If multiple people make blocks at roughly the same time, the network picks one to keep building upon, which becomes the longest and most trusted chain. And any transactions in those alternate branches of the chain get put back into a pool to be added onto later blocks. These volunteers spend thousands of dollars on special computers built to solve SHA-256 problems and run their electricity bills up sky high to keep the machines running. But why? What do they get out of maintaining the blockchain? Is it just... If you want to just sit now, it won't electricity. Uh, it, it consumes a lot, a lot of electricity. Now, what I think was last month, the last month or last two months, Iran had to shut down many of their Bitcoin operators because of the fact that it caused a blackout in the country. Big blackout. So what when he when he said that it, it, I, I, I just it just came to my mind that it happened actually in, in community Iran. service. Well, Bitcoin actually has a built-in system to reward them. Today, every time you win the race to add a block to the blockchain, twelve and a half new bitcoins are created out of thin air and awarded to your account. In fact, you might know the Bitcoin ledger keepers by another name. Miners. That's because keeping the blockchain updated is like swinging a proverbial pickaxe at those hash problems, hoping to strike it rich. When bitcoins were first created in 2009, they didn't really have any perceived value. Tens of bitcoins would have been worth the same as a bunch of pennies. As of November 10th, 2016, though, one bitcoin is worth 708 US dollars, so 12 and a half bitcoins are worth $8,850. That's a nice chunk of change. Every single bitcoin that exists was created to reward a bitcoin miner. Besides the big payout when they add a new block of transactions, miners are also essentially tipped a very small amount for each transaction they add to the ledger. It's also worth noting that every 210,000 blocks, the number of coins generated when a new block is added goes down by half. So what's started as a reward of 50 bitcoins, decreased to 25, then 12 and a half, and it'll only be around 6 bitcoins in a couple more years, and keep decreasing. Eventually, there will be so many transactions in a block that it'll still be worthwhile for miners to mostly be paid in tips. According to current projections, the last bitcoin, probably around the 21 millionth coin, will be mined in the year 2140. This decreasing number of bitcoins is actually modeled off the rate at which things like gold are dug out of the earth. And the idea is that keeping the supply of bitcoins limited will raise their value over time. So, is investing in Bitcoin a good idea? Now that's 
Not really a SciShow kind of question. Bitcoin is still volatile and experimental. A lot of people love it, and a lot of people think it's doomed to fail. We just think it's an interesting idea, and it makes us wonder what cryptography might do for us next. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow. Hello? Uh, what do you think from the video? Uh, what do you think? It is smart to invest in bitcoins or not? He didn't answer. He didn't answer the question. Uh, he just uh, threw it out. Well, every it, I, I'm I'm gonna say this. Uh, Bitcoin is a part of a financial investment that I, I don't really understand very well because of the fact it involves uh, is a new is a new guy on the block. You know. So you know, someone, when somebody, somebody just moved in to, to your block, you don't know the person very well, so you gotta be careful, you know? So, but again, it is an investment. Every investment involves risk. You see what I mean? So you can sometimes you gain, sometimes you lose. As a matter of fact, many many um, many companies in the, uh, in the market are adding Bitcoins to their, port to their portfolio. Like PayPal did it, uh, um, um, what do you call it, um, Tesla. So, like I said, just, just it's an investment, investment involved risk. I, it, it, there, was, there was a time it was going down so fast, I thought it would blow up, but it, it never did. Now it started rising again. So, uh, it, it, it's just an investment. You, just don't make it to be, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't buy only Bitcoin. So that if, when it blows up, you don't lose everything. You can just, yeah, portion, okay, buy a little bit of this and then other. You put the money in other, other places too. Um, any investment can blow, blow up Bitcoin or no Bitcoin. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. So, any other questions? Yeah, um, yes, Professor, I had a question, please. So, is this taxable income as interest, or I mean, when normally I'm only taxed. <laughs> if I have a okay, I'm saying if I have if I have a dividend, I can keep and hold on to my dividend and my dividend can increase, increase increase in value, increase in value. It doesn't matter. I only um recognize a gain when I actually sell that dividend. Okay, let's talk about stock. It makes a little bit more sense with stock. So I have my stock in ABC. I'm selling the stock, selling this, I'm not selling it, I'm not selling it. Hold on, I bought it and da da. And then um, 10 years later, I just say, okay, let me sell my stock. Now I have a gain. I'm going to pay tax on this gain. But all the, all the flexation, flux, fluctuations in the stock, it's not taxable. Like some governments do, some economic systems do tax that. But in our system, we don't. Um, would this be taxable as these prices go up and down? I mean, how is that going to work? Well, um, like, what they're saying is, uh, like, you have a when you have a capital gain from your stocks, yeah, you pay the tax when you sell the stocks. Right. Yeah. So now, um, for Bitcoin, like I said, this I say it's just like a new kid in the block, you know. Yeah, of course, Bitcoin, when you redeem it. Into dollar, when you redeem the, the money into cash, you are supposed, you are, it is why that any income you make, you should pay tax on it. But uh, this thing, this thing is they are still observing it. Um, that's the problem. One of the problem with, with Bitcoin, because of the fact that it is not regulated, not monitored, it can, a lot of things can happen. Uh, but what, what I can, what I know is that if you have Bitcoin, and as a gain, it, it goes up, and you now with now you now redeem it into your cash, into cash. As soon as you're in the United States and you give your big game from Bitcoin into cash, of course, it should be taxable. Uh, but during the time it was going up and down, up and down, of course, it, it, it's a gain, but you, you have, since you have not redeemed it. And what, what so, I, what, 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 when I say redeem, that means sell it. Mm. Um, so, in other words, um, I have five hundred dollars that I want to invest because you said it was investment. I said I'm not going to invest this five hundred dollars in Microsoft. Instead, I'm going to invest it in Bitcoin. So I go someplace and buy these Bitcoins, five hundred dollars worth of Bitcoins. Is that what I would do? Well, um, they have, um, like, like I said, this one is a new. It's very new to me. So what I'm going to do? What you're going to do is this. There are some trading. Uh, uh, what they call it? Um, trading platforms. Um, things like uh, uh, Ameritrade, um, uh, what do you call it? What's the name of the other guy? Um, 
Robin Hood, all kind of trading platform that you can now register and then from there you can buy stock or buy Bitcoin or anything, you know. So, and when I redeem it, it would be the same as when I turn in some of my stock. It, when it sells into a stock, yeah. To, into a, so if I bought $500 worth of, uh, theoretically, if I bought $500, uh, $500 worth of Bitcoin and when I redeem it a year later, it's worth $1,000, I would have a gain of $500 that theoretically the IRS would want to tax me on. Oh, they will, definitely they will tax you on it. <laughs> you work there now, so they, they will, any transaction you make is recorded. So... Um, uh, like uh, uh, there's something that you said before that ups and downs are not taxed. Actually, that tax if you sell, if it goes up and you sell, you will you get to pay tax. But usually, they, they bring you the, the uh, it is usually when you're doing the um, I think during the before you do your tax return, they will bring that uh, they'll will, they will send you the for, from from something there's a form they will send to you that will tell you how much you made the capital gain, and then then it is it is now between you and the IRS, you know. Now, now, I'm not telling you to go and in, I, I, it's not me to, I won't be the person to tell you to go and invest. It's all up to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not telling you that. I'm just trying to explain to you, you know, different kind of money and the uh, means of exchange that we use today. And some of them have been, like Bitcoin, have been traded now, you know. So, um, is there any more question? Miss Manshia, you have a question for us? I'm sorry, me. Oh, so, so uh, no, no, um, no. Yeah. I just, I want, um, if I do my five thousand um, dollars, I want you to uh, stand as surety for that five hundred. So if I lose the five hundred, I want you to be willing to, uh, you know, reimburse me that five hundred. I'm more than willing to put the five hundred in if you're going to stand as surety for the money. If you're not going to stand as surety, I'm not willing to put the five hundred in. Not, no, I'm not telling you to invest anything. Anything about <laughs> investment is your choice, not my choice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you have any, I have so you have any more questions on this? No, I'm fine. Thank you. So you're welcome. So I just want I just wanted to show you guys how the Bitcoin, the principle behind it, a blockchain technology. Uh, okay, Mr. Nunes. Mr. Uh, Nunes, yes. you, have, you have any question for me? No, no question. Miss Lily, how about you? I'm good, thank you. Let's go back to um our um presentation. So uh the first known um the first and most widely known instance of such digital currency um or cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. Yeah, the first one. That's why it's very popular. Um, and they launched it in 2009. Now, as of, to, as of the February of last, of last, that's last month, as of last month, the total value of this Bitcoin is $1.6 trillion. That's a lot. I mean, of course, not easy is the, uh, the value. Of it. Like I say, it keeps going up and down. Now, we have Regulating bitcoins based on uh, Miss Miss Lane, yeah, yeah, Miss Jenkins, your question. You can see the uh, it's, it has been a very big, big, a big problem in some countries. Like I say, Iran. What happened in Iran a few a few months ago, where they have a, the whole country, the whole uh, whole region had a blackout because of bitcoin trading and my, mining. They call it mining, and it's just like mining. That mining is like it's solving the equation that that guy, that uh, young man, was explaining on the video. Consume a lot of electricity and cause blackout. So in some countries that they banned it, uh, I think I think there was a time Japan banned it. I, I can't remember again. I, 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 I will check. So, but is people are talking about now? Shall we start to regulate it? Um, so they still have to have a guidance on how to do that if they if they decide to regulate, uh, you know, Bitcoin. Now I said here that the state financial authorities have taken steps to devise regulation for Bitcoin. Uh, with the New York New York Department of Financial Services, so also that the responsibility to oversee data currency fall upon Congress. And as of now, well, as of the time I prepared this uh, lecture note, um, there wasn't any I won't, uh, there wasn't any congressional action that I that I'm aware of with respect to Bitcoin. 
uh, the task code, Ms. Ms. Jenkins, this probably can answer your question. The task code lacks clarity on how such currency should be treated. Is it digital currency or is it a property or is it a butter or foreign currency? So that's probably why you, you are asking me that question because um, you work, you are, you are there, you are, you know, you are IRS employee. So because of this, there was no clarity yet. It's, it's a new, like I said, it's a new kid on the block. We don't know much about it. I said that it's, it's very exciting to be, to jump in because of the way it grows up, up, then it goes down. And, you know, I don't know. We'll see. So, um, so early cons, uh, concern here is about, uh, you know, tackling the, you know, to do with the consumer protection than more of ambiguities yeah now which brings us to another um, um professor professor mm -hmm. professor yeah here um sorry but you know i just wanted to i wanted to confirm something in my head on the 1040 tax return for 2020 at any time it states at any time during 2020 did you receive sell I, um, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial um, interest, any vit, vit, um, vi virtual currency? Which yeah. that's really helpful to me now. I really appreciate that. Sure. This this is very good. It comes right down my field. <laughs> yeah, that's your field. <laughs> you know what I you know when I came to America, somebody was telling me that um, Americans are not don't really. Are scared of police. What they are scared of is the IRS. Is that true? <laughs> is that true? That's very true. <laughs> when so people IRS... get on the phone, they're so nervous. You can just hear it in their voice. <laughs> the IRS is IRS is more is more mean, mean more mean than the police. <laughs> anyway, it's good in a way because uh, that is where the country makes their money from taxes. So they have to protect their their territory. <laughs> so I don't blame them for that. Anyway, now we're back to uh, mobile commerce and the mobile payment systems. Um, well, they, they are called mobile uh, commerce because they involve buying and selling things uh, through the wireless uh, devices. Like um, they used to have one that they call digital assistant, but now they have, you can use it everything on, the, uh, on, the, on their phone. I remember the time um, when if you want to send a text message, you, let's say you want to put press E, in one key, they're gonna be like E, F, or K. You have to press it like several times before E will show up. But now you can just type in, like you send an email. So, but what I'm trying to say here, I guess, is that this 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 uh, wireless technologies um, uh, the that involve the use of smartphone and mobile uh, technologies, other mobile technologies, <laughs> facilitate trans financial transaction a lot. Um, now. Um, Especially in some economies where the banking, many, many people are not uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, integrated into the banking system. My my grandmother from my mother's side, uh, she doesn't she doesn't know what is a bank. She she know she keep all her money. I mean, in those days, most people in Nigeria wasn't uh, really into banking. Uh, many 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 people uh, they have they have a way of keeping their money safe. They don't trust the banks. In fact, as a matter of fact, before I came to uh, uh, the billions, billions of uh, of uh, dollars. Well, I would say dollars because I, I, we are now in currency. We are in, we are in, we are in America, but billions of what of when you convert it to, to you know to that, that amount of money that is outside the financial system, you're gonna want billions of dollars. Then, but now. You know they are not integrated because of this uh, particular this uh, uh, mobile payment system. People can now send money using their dev mobile devices. Uh, you know, and so those they have they have figured out a way to you know bring those money those funds that are outside the financial system into the you know into the financial system. So if I want to send money, for example, I use that one they use in Kenya. I think they call it in pest. Hold on, let me show you. Uh, show you uh, one they use in Kenya. Um, I think I have. Uh, yeah, so just one minute. Okay, I'm gonna share this. Close this. 
so many, um, like I said, many, many people weren't uh, going to bank. They just they don't have a different way of storing their money, saving their, uh, securing their money. But now, um, and also some there are some remote places where you don't have really banks are not there or there is no electricity. I mean, stable electricity. So now, but you can because of the fact that uh, you can send money, you can still send money to their phone and they go to the bank and then cash it out. So you make it easy for them, especially if they don't have a bank account, you know. Uh, Kenya's, uh, I think it's Kenya's uh, uh, mobile currency. There's a name they, they give it, they give it, uh, mobile money. There's a name they call it there in Kenya. Uh, you can see Mpesa. See, can you see the screen? Yes. Hello? Yeah, you see, Mpesa is a mobile payment service developed by Kenya largest mobile network operator, Safari.com. Launched in 2007, Mpesa was originally developed to, for, to, to allow for payment on microloans to be easily collected. However, it was found that Mpesa users are using the device to transfer money from one to another in addition. So it makes even, you can send money to your grandmother in the village to her phone, and somebody will now help her to go to the bank and then cash it. Instead of waiting for the father, for somebody who is going home, to say, he'll give this money to my mother, you know, you can just send it now and you just get it. Or your father, or your father or your mother, or any relative. Make it so easy. And especially if those people that are sending the money to, don't, if they don't have a bank account, this to make it facilitate it. Say. Now, um, back to our, um, Presentation. I think I opened. I opened so many pages. So let me close some of them so that we can have. Uh, what is this? Okay, let me close this one. Okay. Yeah. So we have more room now. Okay. Now, Walmart estimated that forty percent of all visits to their internet shopping site in December 2012, that is a long time ago, I mean, uh, was from a mobile device. Now you can imagine how much it would be now, because now that everybody, most everybody have smartphone. Yeah. The, volume is, 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 the volume is staggering. As the mobile payment system, the one, as a matter of fact, the one I mentioned about Kenya is, is a type of mobile payment system. Um, so it involved payment services that are operated um, that instead of paying uh, using cash or check or credit card, you use a mobile phone. And th this is a new, I think it was three years ago or four years ago that we started, like the Apple Pay. You have, have you heard of Apple Pay? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. you're coming out from the, from the uh, instead of uh, bringing out a credit card to swipe, you just use your phone and scan it on their on their um, checking out counter. If it's enabled, you just take the money and you don't have to start uh, swiping credit card and so on and so forth. So now um, you have have a key point here. So in countries, in developing countries, mobile payment solutions have deployed or have been deployed as a means of extending financial services to communities known as the unbanked or underbanked, which are estimated to represent as much as 50% of the world adult population. That was in 2009. Now you can see, well, many of them are now, are now banked, but you can see, if you say that 50% of the world population are unbanked, that's a lot of money there. Because there are so many countries, even though they are poor countries, there are lots of rich people there too, that have the money, they have a different system of uh, hiding it or saving it, which, which unfortunately I can't tell you because it would be, uh, you know, for security reasons, <laughs> okay? <laughs> anyway, you, you know what I mean. Um, so uh, they have a different way of storing that money without going to the bank. Uh, so. But now, like I said, a lot of things, this mobile payment system have, are bringing, bringing them, them out. Those money that are not in the, circulating within the financial system 
are now coming into the financial system. Yeah. Now, the forms of mobile payments have the Apple Pay, I've already mentioned it. You can see from, my, from the picture I, I have here, somebody paying at the counter. So instead of swiping your credit card, you just, if you have the app, the app, Apple Pay app in your phone, and their system is, is already is enabled to accept that kind of payment. Just scan your phone, and if you take the money, by the way. Do they, uh, do they charge interest to use Apple Pay? Definitely, of course, there's going to be some way. Somebody have to pay. The, it, might, it might be very little. They charge a month, you know. But if you, if you check how many people who are using it, that's, see, that's what they want to make. They charge it, you're going to be a little. Just a little. They they make their money by the volume of people that use it. Yeah. Do you use it? No, I don't. Yeah. A, lot, a, lot, a lot of people are, you know, it, I like to use it, especially if, 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 during this pandemic. Many people started using it actually because it doesn't involve contact, you know. Um, so next is the Google wallet. So um, it's another, another means of a mobile payment system uh, that you can just scan and go, uh, you know, go and go your way. So um, now the Google wallet can use near field communication, uh, you call it NFC, to make secure payment fast and conveniently by simply tapping the phone on any pay pass enabled terminal in, at the checkout counter, just like the Apple Pay what is being used. Now, which will bring us to the next concept, which is measuring and tracking money supply. This is a little bit different from what you have done so far. So I, I, let, I will say, let us take a short break. And then when we come back, we can now do this. Questions before we go on break? Any questions? No questions. Uh, last week I told you I'm, I'm going to make it up to 20 minutes break. So I'm, I believe you are good with that. Any objection to that? For, for 20 minutes, right? Huh? The break for 20 minutes. Yeah. Any objection for, for that? No. No, no. No. Okay. So I see you back here, um, 11.05. Enjoy your break. Oh, before we go, eh? before we go, you, you guys want me to up upload this um, PowerPoint, this uh, notes for you? If you could, if it's not too much trouble. No, it won't be any trouble. If you have it, I can upload it because this one summarizes uh, chapter four because chapter five, uh, you have to read it. Um, to, to there and do that. And I also have a, a PowerPoint about chapter five as well. I can upload both of them for you if you want. Yes, um, if you don't mind, if it's not too much trouble, sir. Yeah, of course I will. Uh, professor, do you recommend to read uh, the other chapter material if we already read the, the PowerPoint? You mean, for chapter, you mean for chapter five? Yeah, because it's the same information if we read the PowerPoint, then go, go, go to. The, I would, I would recommend, the, I would recommend the, you to reach at a five, because you know the PowerPoint doesn't, it can, you can't, you can't compress everything, in one, but, that's why I recommend that you know to reach at a five, itself, because um, that will have all the information that will prepare you for the test. Okay. PowerPoint, you just take the, go through the key, the key informations, you know. Uh, but since, but like the chapter four, since we are doing it in class with this one, so I'm giving you more information. So they might not need to read chapter four, but you might need to you you need to read chapter five. Since we don't, since we're not we're not covering it today, okay? Hello. Okay. Okay. All right. I see you. Uh, Eleven o five. Enjoy your break. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Yeah, so we are back, eh? So let us, oh, uh, hello. Let us, uh, 
from the doctor. So um, measuring and tracking money supply. Um, now, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, just one minute. So um, I would say I started with, with the time uh, US, I, I just give a, a small history here when the United States has no monetary system. That means that when they were just, um, each, uh, somebody can come out and say, okay, I'm a Virginian. Somebody will say, oh, I'm a North Carolina, you know, that kind of thing. So they have to, even after they, they got the independence, but at the time they still had, there was no, in each region or state have their own currency. So people travel from different states to go with different currencies so they can be able to uh, engage in transaction in other states. At the point, the Confederate State of America had their own dollar they use uh, based on the fact that they, they thought that they would win the war and then separate, you know. Now, most of these currencies are backed by assets. I think I've already mentioned it can be backed by gold, it can be backed by, backed by land, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, during that time, Alabama, the state of Alabama, Kansas, uh, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, even uh, Virginia here, printed and circulated their own, you know, currency. But it was only until after the um, Abraham Lincoln signed the National Banking Act that the federal dollar now become uh, established as the legal tender, you know, of the United States. Now, remember, I started with measuring and tracking money supply. What is money supply anyway? The money supply simply means the entire stock of currency and liquid instruments. When I say liquid instrument, I mean instrument that can be converted into cash very quick. Um, things like a bank bank balance, you are checking accounts, you can convert that money, you can just go and get the money, it can be turned into liquid assets uh, in a very short period of time. So all the, the entire stock of currency and liquid assets that is circulating in a country. That's what they call the money supply. Yeah. So, um, so the money supply reflects different type of liquidity. Each type of uh, money has its own economy and is broken up into different categories. Um, now, this is the three different, I would say three different type of money supply we have. I mean, that's actually how to describe the uh, country's money supply. Uh, or measure it. So we use what they call M's. It can be M O, M one, M two, and M three. You just just the title we give them. Now M O and M one simply mean we call it narrow money because they involve, they include currency, coins, and currency in circulation. Excuse me. For the, the demand deposit, demand deposit when you, when you write a check to somebody, those checkable deposits. And money, but then travelers checks. Now, people, now we have a credit card that we can use, and uh, so tra traveler check is not as popular as it used to be. You know, um, anyway, it's part of the M1 uh, narrow money, and then other checkable deposits. So, of course, the most difficult option here is the coin and currency, uh, as the M1 is a coin and currency because they are already liquid assets. We say liquid because they're already money. You can just use it to buy things quickly. When you go to um, some places, you can you can buy with check. Some places, so they want cash or credit card. You know, some some places accept it. So that's why you say that it is less liquid than coin. Coin they, and currency they accept it anyway. Now we have the near money. Near money includes the narrow money itself. Plus savings accounts, money you have your savings account, then plus time deposits, things like this, certificate of deposits, uh, the CDs. You, have, you know about CDs, right? Uh, Miss Lane, you know about CDs, of course, I'm, I'm yes, sure. Yes, absolutely. Certificate of deposit. Yes. So, uh, no, no, the, the, usually, it's a way of uh, lending money to the bank. They say, okay, we're gonna keep who the, some some in some countries they call it fixed deposits. Um, now I have it uh, also the individual money market account. So each country there's a way they describe their own money supply. You know, 
uh, like here, this one M3 is the money uh, is a measure of money supply that includes all of this M2 plus time deposits, money market uh, funds, short term repurchase agreements, and larger liquid assets. So these are the many broad categories of money supply. Uh, each country uses different measures. Some use some use M1 to describe the money supply. Some use M2. It depends on how the financial, how how sophisticated the financial system of that country is. Um, now, <clears throat> money supply in US, um, according to the data on the Federal Reserve, this is 2019 data. About, um, we have 3.7 trillion dollars in the MY category, M1 category. Then we also have 14.3 trillion in the M2 category, circulating in United States as of 2018. I'm sure it's bigger than that now. Um, um, so <clears throat> next is, it is to, important to note here that our definition of money is checkable deposits that are money. Not, uh, it is checkable, checkable deposits that are money, not the paper check or the debit card. They are not money. You just, uh, they, have, they represent a deposit that you already have in your bank that uh, people now okay, can ask, okay, once you use it, they, they, can now, they can now give them access to that deposit, to the amount of the transaction, you know. Now, um, so that the message that we have here is that counting and tracking the money is in a modern society does not involve, always involve paper, paper bills and coins. Instead, money is closely linked to bank accounts and also Microeconomic policies, economic policies that are involved in the entire country uh, are largely conducted through the, ba the banking system, which brings us to the uh, the financial intermediaries. Uh, when we hear this word, this is just a fancy name for banks. Okay, there's just a fancy name for banks, for like financial intermediaries. Now, uh, using uh, the, one of their main functions to make up a name for them. So, now they act as financial intermediaries because they bring savers and borrowers together. So, now let me explain it in, 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 in it uh, in a simple a simple form. I'm gonna um I have, I have, I hope I have let me uh, open this. Okay, I'm gonna open this thing, this uh, word so I can sh show you. Now this is bank, okay. This is um, borrower, the lender. Which can be, you know, big shot, big men. There are some rich, very wealthy people, or even some an institution like the Federal Reserve. Okay, um, I don't know if you're seeing this. Yep, Federal Reserve. Okay. Or where the you know, individual, not where the individual or corporation. Then, now you can see the bank at the middle. Bank. Okay. And then the borrower. Borrower. The borrower can be an individual or a corporation that wants to do some projects. So, bank at, at the at the middle middle person. Middle institution. So sometimes bank my my borrow from his uh, from the lender, like they uh, usually when they sell their bonds, or they or they borrow directly from the Federal Reserve. When I talk about Federal, I talk about the central bank at one percent, and then they will lend to you the individual at three or four percent, depend depending on your credit. Yeah, well, how risky you are. So that the bank make a profit of uh, 2% profit. So if, if everything goes well, that's bank make their money. And then when you start paying it, they, they pay the lender 1%. Oh, excuse me, I said uh, I should be put 4% here. Yeah, they pay the lender. They take the, their payment and pay the lender and make their money. That is the major way a bank makes their money. They put it from, from the, the lender, which can be- 
It's a better right. idea if we connect it directly to the lender. Say again. It's a better idea if we, if we connect the direct to the lender. Well, the, of, of course, of course, yes, it's better. It's better, of course, so that you remove that uh, you can get the money directly from the lender. But it doesn't always work that way, because the lender doesn't know much about you. You see what I mean? But your bank knows so much about you because it's your, it is your bank. Also, um, even at that, even if, if the bank doesn't know much about you, before they can lend you, they have to do a lot of credit checks. And uh, the, 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 all those things are not doing it free. They have to pay for it. For it. But it makes them to have so much information about you. Like now, if they do a credit check and they are a risky uh, borrower, they can either deny the loan or if they want to give you, they can say, okay, we're not gonna charge you, we're gonna charge you 10% because of the risk of the, of the you know, so depending. Now, if you go directly to the lender, and of course, some people can do that, it still has to pass through the banking system because the bank will do other services, but then track the money, uh, make sure that you, your money was collected and then sent to them. No, if you're a lender, let's say the lender, let's say that you're a wealthy individual, want to buy, yeah, you lend money to the bank, uh, or to, you want to put their money out to lend so you can make more money. How do you start looking for who will borrow from you? And then, if you start looking for somebody who will borrow from you, you're not, you don't have any, a lot of information about the person to make sure that the person will pay you back. There are so many things you don't know about the person that bank already have. There are so many structures they have already that can enable them to track the person to know who he is that you don't have. See, that's why banks serve him. And if you want that, let's say that you meet uh, uh, 200,000 today, um, Mr. Nunes, you know how long it will take you to start? You can't even get it today. I mean, sometimes, you, if, I mean, if you, there are some individuals in the underground economy that can learn, but then, do kind of individual can can a lot of things can happen to you if you don't pay it back, and they charge a very high interest because they don't know you. You see what I mean, Mr. Lewis? Yes, Miss Lily. No, I'm yes. sorry. I made a mistake. You have a question? No, no, no. I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. So you see what I mean? So the bank make those things simplify the whole thing, make it possible that you get the money when you want it. I don't understand something. Uh, why the borrower has the ten percent? What does that mean? Well, if let's say that you have a good credit, yeah, huh? right. Now that means the bank see that there's no risk in lending you the money. They can charge you, okay, three percent because they have to make profit from it. But if you have risk, yeah, risk, that means let's say that you have um, bad credit. Maybe that you, 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 you have borrowed money before from the bank or from here yeah, and you didn't pay it back or you paid very late or the money was charged off before you paid. That means you have some, some risk. So that means the bank will start adding, will add, they have to add the risk of giving you the money plus the amount. The, the, the interest they will charge you. So it is up to the bank to decide how much this risk will be. See, some bank will say, okay, the risk, the risk premium for you is, uh, look, based on, what, what, based on your credit score, you can add extra 6% because of the fact that you might, you might lose your we, we might lose the money by lending to you. So each, each bank decides what their risk premium is. That's why when you apply for loan, you see, you see many uh, banks, so people, this will offer you 5%, this will offer you 2%, you know, because they, they value their risk for it too, in different forms. That way, we add the risk premium to you, then we can, so it can come out to 9%. Now, if another bank say, okay, uh, we're really, we are, really, we are willing to add only 2% risk premium for you, that means plus the 3% interest we want to charge you to make profit then, so we can have, uh, percent interest for you so and so on and so forth now if by giving you this adding this risk this risk premium that you have about you because of the credit and now 
if you if you're able to pay for like a year before you before you default on that loan maybe that, because of the, that risk premium they added maybe they have already collected the money actually even though you haven't paid it off but they have already collected a substantial amount of the money before you went uh into the default now but if you have a good credit it's okay the risk premium is only zero percent zero percent plus the interest we're going to charge it to so that we can make some money they have to get something out of this deal you know give you three percent only so that they can make uh you know their profit you see what is is it clear now to you mr nunes yeah it's better thank you oh, good. welcome so this is what we said a bank as as intermediaries um and this is very being an intermediary uh is a, is a very very important role of the bank and i'm going to explain what, what what i mean by that now suppose you want to buy a house right and your income is sixty thousand dollars a year for example but this house you want to buy is worth three hundred thousand remember if your income is sixty thousand dollars a year you're not going home with the whole sixty thousand you're going home with about forty because you got to pay tax Mr. Mr. Jenkins know about that, right? Ms. Jenkins? Absolutely. Okay, good. So now, but you want to you love this house. You want to buy it, it's worth three hundred thousand dollars but you are making only uh, uh, so, um, $60,000 a year. And your take home after, after the tax will be like 40 or 42,000. Now, if you spread 40 to 42,000 over the years, 12 months a year, um, you're gonna, that's gonna give you, um, I'll have um, the I, that this um, free calculator I use online that I get online. Let me see if I can pull it out from free. Okay, I'm gonna use this. Pull it out. Excuse me. It's called uh, Desmos. It's free calculator that you can get online. Um, so you have it right here. So forty-two thousand dollars you have. Um, forty-two thousand. After tax divided by 12 months in a year, that's 3,500. That I mean, after tax. Now, from this 3,500, you pay your rent, pay your bills, and, and the rest of it. So, and there are seven five hundred dollars If you decide to, so if you, if you say, okay, I don't want to buy the house on credit, I want to pay for it. That means, you, let's say you keep saving $500. How many years will you save $500 before you can come up to 300000 and by that time, even the, the house that you want to buy may not even what it will be worth more than three hundred thousand. So are you gonna buy it when you're already retiring? You know, you want to buy it and enjoy it now. So the only way you can do that is to borrow from the bank and buy it, then pay it off over, over the years. You see what I mean? So you enjoy the house when you are young, you enjoy it when you are in middle age, you enjoy it old age, and still, you know, instead of waiting. Keep saving and saving and saving. Then, when, when after saving so much, when you came to bank to buy the house, the value have gone up again. You see, so bank selling as intermediary is a is a very big, a very important tool, and it makes the economy actually grow. So people can see when people spend money, buy things. Any dollar you spend is income to somebody else who will also spend it. So it made the economy to keep growing and more jobs will be created. So. Um, <clears throat> Now, the Federal Reserve System uh, bring, uh, is the Central Bank of US. So now the idea to watch around the banks and other financial institutions to make sure that they are doing the right thing. They are the regulators. It's just like in a, in a high school, you have the students, uh, the good students, bad students, and the rest of them. But you have the vice principal and the principal making sure that you stay on the line, that kind of thing. That's what the Federal Reserve buy, um, does. In addition to, of course, printing the uh, nation's uh, currency. Uh, thank you. Now, um, in the US, if, of course, we call it Central Bank Worldwide. That's the common name for it, but US, we call it the Federal Reserve or the, or, the, or the Fed. So now, most nations used to have, a, a, many, nations, many nations used to have currency board, but all of them now have uh, uh, banks. Uh, central banks. Now, what do the central bank or the U.S. Federal Reserve do? What do they do? One, they conduct monetary policy. We are going to, we are going to come to that in a, in a, in a short, uh, in a few minutes. 
other one is that they promote stability of the financial system. Then of course, you know, they are, the, they are also um, provide banking services to banks, just the way the banks provide services to us, accept our deposits and some other things. Federal Reserve is the banker's bank. Yeah. So now, uh, other function is this, okay, I've already mentioned the banker's bank. So they, for example, um, commercial banks have an account with Federal Reserve where they deposit their money reserve and they can obtain loans from the Federal Reserve. Just some way you can obtain loan from banks, they also get loan from the Federal Reserve. So now the Federal Reserve also makes sure that the money is circulating uh, in the economy or through the financial system meet the public demand, okay? Now, for example, during Christmas time, when there's a high demand for money, the Federal Reserve makes sure that money is, uh, banks have access to cash that, that they can give out to their uh, customers who want to withdraw from their account. Um, so, now they also make sure that they are, are responsible for assuring uh, banks that stay in line, you know, follow, follow the rules um, and so on and so forth. Now, all the check payments you make through checks, uh, Federal Reserve uh, is responsible for processing some of those checks too. Um, now, um, there's something we call a check clearing that we have. Now, let, let me put it this way. Let me show you in a screen. Um, excuse me, sorry, my mistake. Check clearing. I'm gonna do it. Okay, now this is the bank. This, this is Bank of America. Yeah. How check clearing works. Check clearing. Now, this, this is Bank of America. Uh, this is Bank of America, okay? Uh, bank of America. And this one is um, this one is um, City Group. Okay, this is Bank of America. America, and this is uh, City Group. Uh, City. Bank, whatever it is. Now, so now, of course, you know that people buy things with checks, of course, credit card. Now, Bank of America might have some of their customers having checks, um, uh, Citibank checks deposited in their in, the, in their in their uh, account. Like, for example, if somebody pay me with Citibank check, I have an account with Bank of America. I'll go to Bank of America and deposit the check and get the money. Bank of America, and if somebody from Bank of America, pay a customer what they have an uh, uh, account with Citibank. They will take that Bank of America check and go to the Citibank and then, you know, deposit it to get. At the end of the day, these two banks will go to a place that we call the clearing houses, okay? This is the simplest way of how clearing, bank check clearing happens, which officially is one of the uh, services that, um, Central Bank, Federal, Federal uh, Reserve clearing, clear, clearing houses, or clearing, some places of countries, they just have what they call clearing houses. It doesn't have to belong to any central bank. And they clearing houses, then this bank will present their own check that they have of Citibank. Then Citibank will also present the checks they have of Bank of America, the clearing house. Now suppose that Bank of America has um, uh, $40,000 worth of, uh, what of City, City Bank checks, uh, worth of City Bank checks of uh, City Bank's checks. Checks written on them by their customers. And Citibank has um, $35,000 worth 
$5,000 worth of Bank of America's checks. America's, okay, checks. Checks, okay. Written by their customer. So that means they have to balance it here, out here. So that means Bank of America have to balance City Bank, you know, $5,000 and then and they, they will be on the clear. So, I mean, the process is more complicated than this because there are many banks involved, many checks. So the Federal Reserve uh, can assist in that through their, their clearing houses. They can make sure that, uh, because this bank have already paid their customers that money, but they have to have to balance it out with the banks that have those checks. So this is the simplest way of explaining bank clearing, you know. So I wrote here that, uh, that the Federal Reserve process check, when you write a check to buy grocery, for example, the grocery store deposit the check in the bank account, and then the physical check. Okay, this one just they take they take, they, they take part of it, but at the end of the day, they have to be cleared. You know. Now, uh, <clears throat> which brings us to the remember when I was listing the functions of the Federal Reserve, I wrote conducting monetary policy. So, what is uh, monetary policy? You say so monetary policy involve managing money supply, interest rates, and credit condition with the influence, which influence the level of economic activity in the economy. There are many ways they do this. Uh, but three major methods they use are the one we call open market operations. Um, then changing reserve requirements, and then changing discount rate. I'll explain the three of them open market operations. Now, before you can understand some of this, think of the Federal Reserve as the banker for other banks, okay? So now look at this. Open market simply means uh, when the central bank buy and sell go uh, government securities, we call it uh, government securities, but I actually call it bonds in the open market to either expand or contract the amount of money in the banking system, which in the, at the end of the day, we call it, we affect the economy. Now, let me explain it in this way. Now, banks, uh, federal banks, where they borrow money, where they sell bond, they are borrowing money from the, you know, they're taking money from the, away from the central, from the other banks. Now, if a, if a bank have um, $200,000 to lend, but they have to spend $100,000 to buy bond, uh, uh, bond, that means they have less money to lend and they will lend out less. Now. If the amount, amount, the amount of money they are lending out is so is little, that means businesses will have less access to money to do projects. So it will decrease the level of economic activities because I want loan, but I can't easily get the loan. So that means I can't I can't do a project that will you know make more money for me. And you know when you do a project that make more money, then you might have to need to hire more people. So because I can't do that, that means I can't hire people since I don't have the so I just you know, so uh, that's a way the uh, call it a, a, a way of contracting the economy. But if the Federal Reserve want to expand the economy, create more jobs, they give they do what they instead of buying uh, selling the bond to bank, they buy the bond. When they buy the bond, they pay for it. That will leave much much money in the hands of the bank to lend out. So when the bank start lending, there's cheap credit available. People buy, borrow money to build how to build houses for sale. Businesses can get get access to money to do projects, and by doing more projects, they make more sales, hire more people. That means creating more jobs. So it goes that way. Now, if that happens, the economy is growing very fast. People are getting jobs. That means when people are getting jobs, they are spending money at the same time, and each money they spend becomes income to somebody else. Okay, I, I got a job, for example. Good job. That means I'm going to pay my rent, buy grocery for my family. Now that grocery amount, amount of money you spend in the store become income to the grocery shop. So have more sales, they need to sell more, buy more. Uh, you know, the stock very fast since there is high demand, and to satisfy that high demand, they need to hire more people. Then those people that work for the grocery store also receive that same money that you paid, and 
That means that they can take their family out in the, in the weekend to, 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 to dinner. Going out becomes income to the restaurant and they keep going like that. The problem is this, when the economy is going so fast, people are spending money with more people, more money chasing, more expenses, that it, will, it will push up the price a little bit to inflation, a little bit. So, and when it comes to that point, the Federal Reserve will come in again with the open market oppression to cut down expenses, to reduce the degree of economic activity by, instead of buying the bond from the bank and paying for it, they now sell the bond to the bank. When they buy, buy the bond from them, they will have less money to, to, to lend and they start cutting down lending activities, which in turn with decreased economic activity, more less project, lesser job. And when people are not um, getting jobs, they cut their expenses, bringing the inflation down a little bit. And so you keep going like that. So now, because they did it in the in the open market, that's why they call it the open market operation. Now, um, next, uh, what I just explained is the simplest way of uh, implementing the open market operation. The another method they use is changing reserve requirements. So, in this case, the federal bank, you know, like I said, banks have account with the federal bank with the federal reserve. So. Sometimes they require them to hold up to certain certain percentage of their deposit in that account. So if they say they want them to, or if originally they had, they want them to to reserve ten percent, that means if a bank that have hundred thousand dollars can lend out ninety thousand. But if they say, oh, you have to reserve thirty percent, so that means a bank that have hundred thousand dollars, for example, can only have seventy thousand dollars to lend that will decrease the amount they can lend out and therefore in the long run affect economic activities. Now, if they say, okay, uh, you can lend, keep, you can reserve only 5%, therefore releasing the money into the, into the economy, allowing them to lend more and you know, increase the level of economic activities. Now, that's what, that's what I was trying to explain on this point. Um, in January 2015, the Federal Reserve required to hold a reserve up to 0% where you are requiring banks for the first 14.5 million and deposit then to hold a reserve of 3% of deposits for up to 103.6 million, then up to 10% for any deposit amount that is bigger than that. So, and so on and so forth. So if they increase it, then the bank have less money to lend and business will have less access to cash. So they decrease their project, but if they <laughs> they decrease it, you have the opposite effect. Now, this is um, um, I, I will explain that in a, in a few minutes. Eh, about what happened in the financial crisis, what happened in two thousand eight, where there's it was a shortage. I will explain it. it, it, it there's a cheap cre cheap credit, and it made so many the bank to start doing some lot of uh, um, malpractices that bought, they almost bought their whole economy to a stay halt. Now, and the other one is charging discount rates. Uh, in this case, the Federal Reserve um, will require the banks to reduce their borrowing reserve uh, from the Fed and instead call in low, sorry, my mistake, my mistake. They, that's what they call the discount rate, which is the rate that banks borrow from, from the uh, Federal Reserve. So uh, banks borrow, especially when they need ca immediate cash, overnight. Like if you have a, uh, during a, we have a, let's say the Thanksgiving period, where banks need so much money, you know, because people come in to borrow, to, you know, to spend. So if I give them what they call a federal fund rate, that, okay, I'm gonna give it, uh, you can, I can lend you at the rate of 3% or 4% or 1%. So. Now, the bank get the loan from the Fed at 3% or 1% or even 2%. Then they go to customers and lend it at 5% or 6% uh, depending on the credit. So the federal discount rate is the interest rate set by the central bank on loans extended to, um, to commercial banks. Sorry, I, I, I don't need that. Commercial banks, let me correct this. Banks. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Extended by the central bank 
an offer to eligible commercial banks or other depository institution to reduce the problem and pressures of reserve requirements. So um, these are the three ways that the Federal Reserve can control the money supply. So if they increase the discount rate, they increase it. That means bank will have less to lend. If they decrease it, bank will have more to lend. So you see the money supply keep going up, down, depending on the uh, direction that the monetary uh, um, authority wants it to go. Yeah. Now, question before I continue. Any question? Um, I just had one question, please. ACH, I see that on my screen a lot. It stands for um, ACH. I can't think of what it stands for. But um, Automat autom automated clearing house. Yes, remember, yes, yes, yes. Remember, I told you the Federal Reserve is involved in clearing, check clearing. So they clear. All so the that so so the ACH fits into that clearing house part of the presentation. Because, yeah, 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 because now, now it is done. And that one is electronic way of clearing, clearing checks and other, other transactions. So you call it ACH. See, everything, every payment, like credit card, sometimes uh, they check, they still have to clear through the Federal Reserve System. They have a system. Because different banks have different credit cards, different checks, you know. Uh, if you remember the, what I was explaining, the check clearing, the simplest explanation of it. Um, you remember that? Yes. So it's like that. So now this one, it is done electronically. You can see when you make a payment on check, or if you have a um, what do you call it, auto automa automatic uh, withdrawal set up for your account, you see that ACH showing when it is done clear in your bank. Remember. I don't know if you, if, you, if you get to what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I, I got it. I understand. Um, we see that when people at the IRS, taxpayers have um, direct debit installment agreements. Yeah. And it'll show, up on, it'll show up on my screen, ACH. So I see how that fits in now. Yeah, and also, when some, some checks, when you pay with checks sometimes, and the, and the checks cleared, sometimes they check, show it on your, if you, if you look at the account online, you see it. Or sometimes even when you have a direct deposit, sorry, uh, automatic withdrawal uh, arrangement with the company. They say you have a subscription that withdraw you know, every month. You can see it there too sometimes, depending on whether it passed through the federal clearing system. Okay. So that answer your question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, what I'm asking was, did that answer? Well, did I answer your question, <laughs> Mr. Ness, Miss Lane? Miss Lane, you there? No, I'm here. Yes, I'm fine. Now, let me let me summarize it fast because I know that uh, Mr. Mr. Ness, you are going to you are going to work today, right? Ah, uh, yes. So let me summarize this fast. Wow. The financial markets. Uh, when we talk about financial market, it includes. I think by now you, have, must, have, you must have noticed that each chapter comprises of different concepts. Uh, because like uh, that the course contain have the all a lot of information that uh, you know for you. Now, the financial market um, simply means um, all the. Um, the marketplace where buyers and sellers can participate in trade of assets like bonds, currency, um, stocks, and derivatives. We have different different types of financial markets. We have the what that we call primary and secondary markets. Excuse me, the capital market, money market, and foreign exchange market. So now, what you have to know is this: there is no big house built and called primary market. Or second market. These are just the name of the type of transaction being done. So when that transaction is done, uh, when they, like for example, when a when a company is coming out to, for the public to sell shares, we call it the primary market. So when they sell their share for the first time, 
We call it the I, we call it usually call it the initial public offer. It's called the prime, they do it in the primary market. It's just the type of name for the type of transaction. You see? So there's no building or no office called primary market. It's just the type of transaction they are doing there. Now, secondary market is what you're doing, stock market. <laughs> Excuse me. Like now, we want to buy shares of Bank of America. It's not a, it's not a new share, it's an old share. Because Bank of America have been a non public decades ago. So any share you are buying from Bank of America is the share that is owned by already owned by somebody else who is want to sell it. So because it is the old security, not a new one, we call it the secondary market. Okay. Now um, the um money market is the short term for uh you know, uh for a market for liquids uh, for uh, market uh, money market securities things like um. Certificate of deposits like CDs, uh, US um, treasury bills. When you buy treasury bills, we are it's like you're, you're lending money to the US uh, government. And treasury bills, I think the majority is the one that matures in. Okay, let me show you some of the um, US, uh, excuse me, the, some of the securities that the US government sells. Usually, you can have them by going to a place we call them. Um, Treasury Direct. Let me see if I can open it from here. Uh, Treasury Direct. Yes, good. But you will be, I think. Oh, this, I hope this brings it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here. You can see all kind of uh, <clears throat> financial instruments that government uh, say, like if we're looking for the Treasury bills. Um, all the, all the auction that the Federal Reserve will do can sh be shown here. Um, instruments, treasury securities and programs. If you click on it, you can see the treasury bills. <coughs> now, these are short, can you see the screen? Yes. So these are short-term government securities that matures uh, from a few to 52 weeks. So you have a short maturity time. But because you know, you know, US Treasury bills is, is very safe. Because of that, the amount of money you make from it is not much. The interest rate, see, you can see, you can see this is, your minimum purchase is hundred dollars. So you can buy hundred, but the interest rate on it is little. Um, you can, yes, you can see the rate. Uh 0.3 percent because it is a, it's a safe investment. So only when you buy large quantity of it that you can make money on it because it's safe. But it Treasury bill from country that from risky countries like a uh, country like uh, Mexico or a country like um, Argentina or maybe most of the or most of the African countries um, they pay higher interest because they are more risky so you can make more money buying from them uh, but at the same time you can also lose money <laughs> US Treasury bill is the safest in the world so that means they have never defaulted even they're not defaulted for once but Country, even travel bill from China is risky too. And they pay you more interest from buying than, than from buying the one from the US. Now, treasury bill from Russia is also risky because Russia have defaulted before. China have defaulted before. US have never defaulted. So because of that, they are they, to attract you to buy their bond or treasury bill, they offer you more interest. See? Um, than US. So you can see this one is a four weeks treasury bill. So as, as the number of weeks increases, the interest that you earn goes up. Okay. Um, so let me take you back to uh, where we are. Now, the capital market is just like I said, this is a, just a type of transaction they do. Market for long-term security, like the New York Stock Exchange. There are all kinds of securities you can buy there, even bond, uh, 10-year bond, five-year bond, and so on and so forth. Um, now, then the foreign exchange market, which is the largest market in the world, doesn't. And the, the funniest thing about the foreign exchange market is that there's no market. It's just a, a, a connection, a, a network of terminals, computer terminals, and you know, with a phone connection, internet connection, where you can buy and trade currencies. So it is made up of banks. Commercial companies, central banks, investment bank, banking firms, hedge funds, and it never sleeps. The, the foreign market is 
always on. But it's the most volatile market in the world too. Uh, just like uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is more volatile. At least in the financial market, you know that this is what I'm trading. It is, it is regulated, but Bitcoin is not, um, they still haven't find any kind of way to regulate uh, the market. Now, the rest of this thing, you can actually um, accept as how business how business can raise money um, and then early state of financing and so on and so forth. So let me not keep you here. As you can see from here, it's more about the reading, reading, reading. And they are self explanatory until the last one. And does any of you have objection to us um, uh, ending the class now? It's up to you, Professor. What is it? Does any of you have, since, since some of you have to go to work? Yeah, so I have to work at one o'clock. So, yeah, so I, um, I have some time left. So you can see from here, this is where we last place we stop. So from here down, it's all reading. And they are very really self-explanatory. You can understand it. So I would say complete it and then um, do um, uh, the part, um, the quiz and the test that I do. And then I have one more thing I have to tell you. Um, yeah, just do that. That's basically what it is. And um, you have a nice weekend, okay? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.